none of them really needs an introduction. And there's not enough time for me to do justice with um, their leadership trajectories. And in some cases, my personal gratitude and enormous uh, appreciation for their beingness. So I'm going to be very disciplined and be tiny, tiny, tiny in um, the introduction of our panelists. I'm going to follow just how they sat. And so next to me is Ted Bunch, who um, leads, co-leads A Call to Men, and who, um, if you haven't seen or been um, working with Ted, it's a must, you know, in your bucket list your bucket list of leadership, your bucket list of social justice, gender justice, racial justice, economic justice, which by the way are all intertwined and maybe we will have in our conversation around um, gender relationships. In the case, we are talking about men and women, but I also want to acknowledge that there are many non-binary expressions of gender that need to be part of our conversations. Um, so please, mark that bunch in your bucket list for leadership. Malika Dutt um, is an incredible creative person that has, a, my opinion, a fierce brilliance that um, has generated specifically a particular organization called Breakthrough that I think in many ways um, expresses Malika's own growth and own generative leadership. And um, breakthrough dwells in the realm of culture and storytelling and how that changes human beliefs, human values, and behavior. Um, Abigail Disney is somebody that um, you know, I have to be very careful because, you know, like the little lemmings, I feel like a little lemming in relation to Abby. If Abby said, you know, I want to just go down that cliff over there, chum, I, I, I'd be doing that, you know. That's the depth of my trust, admiration, learning. Um, Abby is not only um, revolutionary in so many ways, but also in culture but is, you are a very courageous person, a very brave woman that finds a way to tell the truths that have to be told with enormous amount of love. And that in and of itself is something that is very rare in the world. We are, I am, and we are deeply embedded, indebted to, to Abby and embedded in, Ab in Abby's leadership, <laughs> indeed. And last but not least, Gary, who um, has been working in globally around the issues of men and boys. And um, I think that we promote that you have this incredible opportunity to share with us a global perspective that is so important for this conversation. So you can see that this is an irresistible group of activists and thought leaders to spend some time with us this afternoon. I asked them to initially talk about what's most important to them about their work and what they have learned from that. Um, evidently, you know, we are uh, part of a day here, part of a process. So um, I expect, and everybody's completely free to co-create your answers, of course, your time that you want to talk about, because you've been spending the day here, and it's most important that we be present in the moment. So I'm going to ask Malika to start us off. OK, I'm going to stand up, because I'm kind of small, and this uh, chair is <laughs> engulfing me. <laughs> yes. So one of my biggest lessons is that we don't take time to celebrate our victories enough. So what I'd like to do is invite us all to take a moment to celebrate this moment of the demise of patriarchy. <laughs> Stand up, shake your arms, move your bodies like her. Historic moment! 
We are bringing it. We are bringing it. Hallelujah. Okay. So, keeping with the um, keeping with the theme of celebrating, I want to share a story with you guys, which is probably going to be a little unexpected, and I'm a little surprised at myself for sharing it. But then you introduced me as being fierce and creative, so what the hell, right? <laughs> so last night, I went to something called Tantra Speed Dating. Um, there were about 80 people, 40 men, 40 women, and it was, uh, just to make sure we get all the gender, binary, all of those kind of issues out of the way, it was for heterosexual people. We were holding the polarities of the masculine and the feminine. And it was a really, really interesting experience. It was multi-generational, multi-racial, and interestingly enough, there were exactly 40 men and 40 women. Maybe it was 38 and 38, but you know what I mean. Like, there were exact numbers of men and women. And we stood in circles with the women in the inside circle and men on the outside circle facing each other. And we did one minute energy connection stations. And we, and we would sort of do an energy exchange and then the women would move left and move left. And so each woman and each man had a minute with each other. So I've been working in the field of violence against women for God knows how many decades now. I've lost track. Um, and you know, my ex-husband and I separated in not the easiest way. He got involved with the woman who used to clean our house. Fierce feminist in this storyline, you know, with the husband who's um, the feminist storyline, you know, leaving you for a woman that he can have more power over. Intersectional analysis means that it's not so simple. How do you honor their relationship while dealing with your pain, while having an understanding of power? You know, all of that. Very, very painful time. And so stepping back sort of into the dating scene has taken me a while. So going to this thing was not an easy thing to do, right? And I was really curious, because one of the, the places that I've been exploring in terms of how women and men come together to create emergent space is where does the spiritual, where does the personal, and where does the political come together? How might we start creating new braids, different braids, of how we step into what emerges post-patriarchy? And what was amazing for me last night was the way the exercises were constructed. There was very little talking. And yet, we were able to connect as human beings in some deeply, deeply profound ways. There was this one moment where the facilitator asked, all the men to get down on their knees in front of the women and apologize, and apologize for all of the violence and the pain that their brothers had inflicted, had inflicted on women. And I had like a 20-something-year-old guy who had so much attitude about going down on that <laughs> knee, right? Like, what the fuck? And yet, because of the way in which that circle was held, when he went down on his knee and he looked at me and I looked at him, there was something that happened. That there was something that happened in that moment where something shifted for him and something shifted for me. We also did an apology for all of the ways in which the feminine had wounded the masculine. Because I think in the world of patriarchy, we have all practiced power over, power under, power in all kinds of horrible, 
horrible ways. And so part of the story of the emergence of what next requires us to really own our own shit. All of us, men and women together. I left Breakthrough a year ago. Breakthrough works on ending violence against women through an intersectional lens, India, the US, globally. Lots of storytelling, lots of partnerships with some of the men that are right here in this room, lots of folks with Abby for decades, lots of folks in this, in this room who have been fellow travelers. And when I left, I really just needed some time out because I realized that from having worked on violence for as many decades as I had, I had so much trauma in my being, in every part of me, that I couldn't imagine a future because everything inside me was hard, hardwired towards being a warrior. Even if I was a warrior in partnership with men, the only thing that I knew how to do was be a warrior. And many of my warrior tools were patriarchal because I didn't know how else to fight back. It may not have been fighting physically with men, but I certainly used my mind like men do. I certainly used all of the ways in which men move agendas to build the organization, raise resources, do the positioning, do the marketing, but how else were we going to create? How else were we going to create? Stop. Let's not do this anymore. And so I'll just end with this because I know we don't have a lot of time and we have such amazing people all afternoon today. Where I'm at right now is exploring the idea of interconnectedness. The idea of interconnectedness as the place of consciousness, as the paradigm from where I can stand to hold space for the emerging possibilities of what we can co-create together. There are many of us engaged in dismantling patriarchy. And I have done decades of that work. What I am stepping into right now is the idea of interconnectedness, connection, belonging. What happens if we can start creating circles of healing, circles of accountability, circles of creativity, circles of possibility? I don't know what that looks like. What I do know is that there's a huge need for us to step into being versus doing, to learn how to show up differently, to heal ourselves so that we can show up differently, so that what it is that we co-create moving into the future does not resemble what we are watching the destruction of right now. I'm going to stay sitting, but I'm going to go cross-legged like Malika because she's smart. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how to follow that, um, except that I love Malika, and um, she followed her heart, so I'll follow my heart. <laughs> um, I'm the accidental feminist. I was raised by the, the er, self-loathing woman. <laughs> um, Phyllis Schlafly, Rush Limbaugh had a baby, and that's who my mother was. <laughs> Not a pretty picture, is it? Um, and, and, and who she was was someone who had been raised in a very um, um, traditional context, Irish Catholic, very patriarchal family, um, and had spent her whole lifetime enforcing patriarchy because that was what she understood her job to be, right? She thought she was helping me when she said, I should never have let you play on the boys' soccer team because now no one will ever ask you out. <laughs> 
um, she thought she was helping me. Um, and and um, of course, you know, it didn't, it didn't feel that way. Um, but the longer she went in her life uh, enforcing patriarchy, I think a lot of women of a certain age um, have this choice when they get to their 60s and 70s. Uh, are we going to fess up and say that maybe all that time we were doing a bad thing? Or are we going to double down and, and go forward and not acknowledge the pain that has been left in our wake? Um, and and it, didn't, it wasn't just me with the pain. My brothers, I think, probably suffered more from, from her enforcement than, than anyone. Um, we, we, as we dismantle patriarchy, are up against um, a lot of different kinds of things, not the least of which is other women, sadly, um, and women like my mother, the self-loathers. Um, uh, I am saying that because um, I tiptoed into feminism. I, I absorbed a little bit of her antipathy and went off to college, and I remember the first Take Back the Night March of my first year of college, 1978, and I was like, who are those angry women? What are they so mad about? Oh my gosh. And underneath that was, I'm not gonna go out there because I hear the way the men are talking about those women. And I'm 18, and I just got out of jail, and I am so not making myself unattractive. <laughs> to the first guys I've ever been allowed to be alone in a room with, <laughs> right? And the stakes felt too high. The social punishments were so intense. Um, but fairly quickly in college, I kind of started to absorb some language and develop some independence. And I would go back home, and the social punishments were there, too. The social punishments are get a sense of humor. Why, can't, why do you take everything so seriously? You're shrill, you're angry, you're bitter, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so I had this kind of struggle in myself about the, 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 the hairy armpits and the anger and <laughs> all of the things that I had been instructed to believe about, about feminists. And, uh, and I remember um, I was in graduate school in the 1980s and 90s, and um, the only place left you could be a feminist was grad school. <laughs> it, it really retreated into the ivory tower for, for the 80s. Ronald Reagan really chased us from the public square. And, um, and Helen Hunt asked me to come to the New York Women's Foundation breakfast. And my inner voice said, oh, no, <laughs> it's gonna be boring, and they're gonna be so angry, and, I know what they're going to say already and whatever. I really was that hostile to it, and I came to this breakfast. And here were women I never, you know how you meet women that you never even imagined could exist. You know, it's that you thought you were going to walk into a room full of stereotypes, and what you walked into was a room full of surprises. And, uh, and they were all about, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do today? What are we going to do with our creativity? I know we have no power. I know we have no money. But there's all this stuff we can do. And I was instantaneously converted to a sensibility about feminism that was, I, now I know the word intersectional, and, um, and now I know a lot of things. But at the time, I thought of it as, God, I thought feminists just said no. And now I know they say yes to almost everything. Um, and that has defined me as a feminist um, ever since. You know, I, I, somebody described to me in philanthropy, there's like a woman standing by a river. I don't know if you've heard this story already. And there's babies in the river. And so what do you do? You run into the river and you pull the babies out because that's what you do. It's natural. And then after a while, you're not getting all the babies, so you start teaching them to swim. And at some point, you go upstream and figure out who's throwing babies in the river, right? That's kind of the world of philanthropy. Um, I was an upstream goer. I was a person who couldn't stop going upstream because upstream somebody was throwing in the babies in the river and then upstream from that person was somebody who was teaching somebody to throw babies in the river and upstream from that somebody was monetizing the babies thrown in the river. And so so um, upstream, upstream, upstream led me weirdly, crazily back to the very business, my family. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> and and I, I didn't. I left LA, kind of saying like I'm going to have nothing to do with Hollywood and nothing to do with the movie business. These are bad people. They have bad values, and I don't want to be around it. Um, and of course, I had to acknowledge that you know we are all situated in a very particular place. Each of us, each of us, is an individual on this planet. And I got situated in the Magic Kingdom. And. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I and I had to take even if I d wasn't personally responsible for any of it, I had to take responsibility for the fact that a thousand young women, a million billions even young women, grew up on a diet idea of a princess who yeah. sleeps through the entire film and waits for a man to kiss her. <laughs> um, that is so damaging. Um, who 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 made a film like Song of the South that I don't even need to tell you about, except that James Baskett, who was the star of that film, wasn't allowed to attend the premiere of his own film because he was black and it was in Atlanta. Um, you know, I, I've spent a long time trying to figure out like what is my duty, what is my obligation? And the reason I circle around this, I have a very unique, obviously a unique life and a unique life situation, but, but I, I circle around this in public because I think we all as Americans owe the world this process. And we all own a certain amount of responsibility for perpetuating patriarchy, for perpetuating racism, even if only as accomplices or beneficiaries. Um, I also come from a family on my mother's side that owns slaves. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out what well, my debt is there. But here, here's what I know. Um, my, my mother suffered um, deeply for the engagement she made in patriarchy. She may have embraced it out of a desire to make her own life better or, or to go where the advantages were, but in the long run, it made her less of a person. There was no way to live fully committed in a system which diminished half of the world just because um, without diminishing herself, um, no matter how many material advantages has brought her. And likewise, White people were so diminished by owning slaves, and white people continue to be diminished by, by practicing racism. Um, when I listen to the Me Too movement, I listen to the way men are trying to accommodate it, I, I feel an enormous amount of empathy and compassion for men in their 40s, 50s, 60s who really do feel like the rug is just being pulled right out from under them, and they don't know what to do with themselves. Um, but, uh, but I am constantly stunned and amazed by this retreat into, well, I have daughters. I have wives. Um, and I don't know what it's going to take to get them to the point of saying, well, I'm a human. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of, I've, I've immersed myself in media because I've seen the way people are changed. I had a, in Congo, in Kinshasa, we had a screening, and a man literally came up to me. This is a 78-minute film. In 78 minutes, he came up to me and said, I came here thinking women couldn't really do anything. 72 minutes, a person can change like that. Um, so I'm really committed to media because I've seen the way it creeps into hearts. If for the bad ways in turning us into princesses, we shouldn't be, but also in the good ways for changing people's hearts about other people's capacities and humanity. Um, but I, I think, I guess, I, I'm, I'm appealing for help in thinking through this question of, um, how do we get through that last final barrier of, of, of getting a man to watch and talk about sexual violence and coerced sexuality, whether it's financially or whether it's persuasively or whatever form of persuasion it is um, or coercion it is, um, and feel that as though it were happening to himself? How do we break through that stubborn, stubborn barrier of white people when people say to you, but you're benefiting by being white, how do we get through that last barrier that makes us defend ourselves in that situation when it's a morally neutral statement? It's just a statement of fact, you know? And, and like, if you would just feel what that feels like for five minutes, as a, as a fellow human being, you might be willing to roll your sleeves up and figure out how to help. Um, so I'm on this, like, I'm in a kind of career moment of trying to figure out. There's, there just seems like, we, I have seen so much change in my work life. I have seen so much change over the last quarter century. I, I just need help figuring out, there's this one wall. I've never seen a bigger one. I've never seen a more stubborn one. It's deep in our hearts. And it, it, doesn't, have, it doesn't have to do with being male or being white, but holy shit, white men. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> how, how do we soften? Indian men are pretty bad, too. <laughs> how, how do we do that? And I think it may involve 
um, it may involve constructing a road back from the, um, the island of exile to which we're sending people. And I think it's too early to talk about a road back in anything like concrete terms. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to see Charlie Rose's fucking face. <laughs> but, but I know that one of the biggest barriers we're facing right now is that there is no island to vote these people off onto. They continue to be human beings with us on Earth. And if there is one value that I continue to embrace with all of my heart from my childhood is you love everybody, even the bad ones, even the ones who seek to do you harm, as Jesus said. Um, we need to love these people back. Um, and we need to welcome them back onto this island. Because first of all, it's not practical. There's nowhere to send them. And second of all, <laughs> um, if, if the punishment is death, then where, where will we get the voluntary, willing, compassionate, empathic response to the accusation that we really, really need? Or not, not even the accusation, the statement of fact. Um, so I just, that's, I'm gonna throw that out there and let you all think about it, that's it. Well, I'm gonna stand, um, thank you, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I had a certain thought and idea of what I wanted to say today, and that's gone. It's just gone. <laughs> Between Malika and Abigail and your truth and speaking from your heart, and I really appreciate that. And um, so I'll stay in the moment. Uh, and I do want to say something, you know, when, when you were sharing, you know, your uh, your divorce, and, and I was thinking about my own. I've been married, I was married over 20 years, divorced about five years. I've never shared this publicly. And uh, it was amicable. We worked out things very well. We do it very well. I mean, it's, it works out. Listen, it worked. We were divorced three years and adopted a kid together, oh. if you can believe that. <laughs> so, we, so we have a partnership with our children, and we added another child even in this. So it, 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 it can be done in a way that's loving and respectful also. And, um, you know, I, I just know that always fighting uh, against anything we need to fight against, when we bring love to it, it gets better. And the same thing here. And the same thing with white men, actually. You know, I think that one of the things, um, I was out, uh, we do quite a bit with um, Michael and I were at Time's Up, uh, we, two days after it happened, we pretty much went out there and talked to some men at Time's Up. And one of the things that um, is especially important, and I think something to notice, is that uh, this moment is so special. It really is. We've turned a corner, there's no doubt about it. And it's, and it's bringing up a lot of anxiety for men, which is good. It's long overdue. We need it. It creates this anxiety and it makes men want to do something. And as Michael said, it, it, uh, it, you know, this anxiety we can use in a positive way. And it's important to call men out, you know, because they need to, we, uh, we need to hold men accountable and women need to have voice and speaking about these things, hoping to bring healing as well to the victims. But we also need to call men in. And we have to call men in in a way that they can hear it. And it's not necessarily something, it's not to make it easier for them. You know, we want to affirm the experiences of women, but also provide hope and healing for men as well. And our work at A Call to Men um, just does that. Uh, our work, um, our mission is to create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful, and all women and girls are valued and safe. And we are really, um, uh, intentional about that word all because we know we need to say all because if we don't say all then we're not going to think about that financially poor woman in rural Texas or the Hmong woman in Minnesota or uh, the um, the black women woman in um, Mississippi so we're intentional about all we're talking about the margins the last girl in your community and she may look like a transgendered woman so we, our work is to promote and increase a healthy, respectful manhood. And we know that as we do that, we decrease and prevent domestic violence, sexual assault, bullying, homophobia, it all goes away. So that's what our work is. And the moment is very important because it really allows men, this is where men of color, black men and white men, and this is where the time's up. I was out there speaking to all these white men of influence and wealth. And there's common ground that we have. 
there's a common ground as men that we have, that we can, we can work on this together. It's not just pointing the finger. It's pointing, you know, uh, I forget where I first heard it, but when you point one finger at someone, four are pointing back at you, you know. <laughs> And so, so we can work this thing together. And it's not just about, uh, it's, it's about all men and the collective socialization of manhood and how we're passing that down to our boys. And so we get, um, we're fortunate to have the support of Anna's amazing leadership and also the, women, the New York Women's Foundation because they recognize that an investment in a call to men is an investment in women and girls, mm -hmm. right? Because it's about prevention, it's about going upstream. It, that's what it's about. We have a high school curriculum um, called Live Respect, Coaching Healthy and Respectful Manhood that we wrote with Scholastic. It's doing very well around the country. And one of the things that, uh, one of the questions we asked when we were developing the curriculum was, do you know what consent is to high school boys? Can they define consent? Only 19% could define consent. 81% did not know, 81% did not know what consent was. Eight out of 10 boys, your boys and mine, I'm talking about your boys and mine, did not know what consent was. Eight out of 10, and that explains a lot. It explains sexual assault in the military, it explains sexual assault on college campuses, it explains why girls and women between 16 and 24 are at the highest rate of being sexually assaulted, it explains sexual harassment in the workplace. It explains all of that because we don't teach our boys to have boundaries of any kind, especially not around respect, if I have an 18 year old boy in your community right now and he's a good kid, wouldn't harm women or girls, and he goes out on a date with a, with a, with a young woman, let's say she's a senior in high school also, he goes out on a date, he, he gets back from the date and his friends knew he went, his, his, his male friends knew he went, he gets on Instagram or Snap, Snapchat and they went to a movie. When he gets back home, are those boys asking him how the movie was? No. no. Because we've taught them that it's about the sex, it's about objectifying her. Actually, the, the way we define ourselves as men, one of the ways is by distancing ourselves from the experiences of women. And that's what we do, Michael, Gary, Don, Carl, Jimmy, we want to close that gap. Because when we close that gap, then men recognize that the liberation of men is directly tied to the liberation of women and that we're gonna gain, as Michael said, we're gonna gain from that. We're not losing, we're not losing from that. So our work is really around men and boys, and we do this um, from middle school with this curriculum all the way up to professional sports. We go from the boardroom to the barbershop is what we say, you know. We're really in all communities, wherever there's men and boys, we're in the process now of working, talking to the Boy Scouts about creating a live respect patch that's around gender equality, and homophobia prevention, and yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, that'd be hot, that'd be hot, I gotta say. Yeah, so, so, so our work, uh, we work with all professional athletes as well, you know, so all of that's great because it gives us credentials to work with men in community. That's really what it's about. If you can say you work with the NFL, then any high school is gonna let us in, any college is gonna let us in, and that's why it's important. But our, our work was born here in New York out of the battered women's movement. That's where we were born out of the battered women's movement. And we had the great pleasure of being in rooms such as this 20 years ago, learning from women and learning how male dominance plays out. And um, we take great responsibility in carrying that message in a way that's accountable and respectful to women. And actually, we always have systems of accountability to women because we know that if we don't have that, if we just get together with the men in this room and we say, this is how we need to end this thing, this is what we need to do, and we're not hearing the voices of women, we might be doing more harm than good with the best of intentions, right? Because we do have good intentions, but often misguided or just not informed. So um, there was so much I wanted to tell you all. <laughs> so um, I think that the most important thing that I can say just about our work is that we're, we're really looking to invite men to the conversation. Not, not just indict men for being men, but invite men for, to the conversation. And that what I found similar to what Michael shared, is that men who know better want to do better, and we do have to sometimes tap into those, um, I think, uh, the woman from, um, break, uh, from the, the objectification? Norma. Norma, Norma I'm sorry. Norma had mentioned about touching people, t uh, talking, telling stories 
of men, men telling stories or connecting them to the daughters and the women in their life. That's what we have to do. We're intentional about that. We have to because men are not connected to women unless it's the women and girls in their life. So we have to start there, right? And then go out from there so that they recognize that, oh, I really do need to work at having my community be safer and better and that values women. And I need to pass messages down to, to boys and men in my community that value women because that is going to impact my daughter or the women in my life. And others will be hopefully benefit from that as well. So um, I do, again, want to just thank the, uh, the organizers for the invitation to come here. Thank you, Marianne, and the Women's Fund, and um, uh, Michael in the center for the opportunity to have this conversation and be a part of this. So thank you. Um, wow, I don't think you should leave a, yeah, I don't think you should leave a white man last on the, I do not at all say that this is a last word. In fact, if anything, these are, this is the beginning words that all of, that all of you have shared. And thanks for that. I'm also going to change up just because um, a lot of what Call the Men does, we do ditto, but let me, let me start with a different way. Um, I got into this field, or it got into me, um, very early on in my years in high school. Uh, I witnessed in a room about this size what we now call high school shootings. Um, you, I don't need to describe the details because you've seen them, whether it's Santa Fe or Parkland or all the rest, a young white man with a gun taking it out on others. Um, in that, and I'm not going to go into a long, long, lots of layers of details there, but one of those, when time stops and you're kind of looking at what, what's going on, one thing among many others that called my attention was that girls were expressing grief, hugging each other, crying, openly willing and showing how harmed their lives were by what just happened to one of our classmates. And guys weren't, for the most part, very few. Scratching their legs on the floor going, wow, what size gun was that? What the fuck was that? It was us in our bubbles of being what we're taught to be as boys and men. Not to show vulnerability, not to show the pain, not to show what just happened in front of us. And I think among many moments, there was a spark of like, where does this come from? How are we, how are we raised to be in this sense of manhood means you don't show that you're afraid, you don't show um, that you've got deep emotions, you don't stop and ask directions, you don't take no for no, all those things that we know we layer on manhood. That was one of the moments that for me said, there's something about this and there's something I need to do to be part of a resistance about it. Um, I moved to Brazil early in my career. That was all about a love story, and I can tell you that over a, it's a longer conversation. Um, but definitely the wisest move that I've made in a, you know, in a couple few decades. <laughs> um, and one of the things that my wise partner, who I'm still with, basically said, folks will talk to you in Brazil and let you do work in this gender stuff if you pretend you don't know, if you assume, not pretend, you assume you don't really know anything about us. Um, that both worked well in my relationship with her. <laughs> And it worked very well um, in terms of looking at how, how was gender being played out here? How was it working? And one of the studies that I first started working on was with UNICEF of girls who were being sexually exploited. And after four or five nights, the stories of girls and how they got there were obvious and clear and they repeated. But I said, I want to talk to the men. Why are they paying for this? And I'm really curious about that guy who I've seen here twice in a row who's talked his friend out of paying for sex with a girl that I just kind of listening at the edge and said, here are the voices of resistance. Here are guys like me, I think, not the guys paying for sex, but the guys saying, we're able to question this stuff. This version of manhood that's foisted on us is not one that we live with. And in fact, most of us, and I would say a majority of it, and that's we've been doing research on this for a long time, most men don't agree with this stuff. <laughs> the issue is the challenge of helping them break out of it. On the way, I had the chance to meet and work with folks who had studied under Paulo Freire, if many of you know of him, the Brazilian educator who worked on this idea that if we're collectively aware of the forces around us, put up there, I think I saw somebody talking about cariarchy instead of intersectionality. Same thing he was saying many years before. If we understand how these work, collectively, we can do something to overcome them. That's what's informed a lot of feminist activism, and it's what informed Promundo. So started the organization with that. If we can raise awareness about this collectively, we can find ways forward. 
two big learnings from that and what we continue to take forward in terms of our work is one, I think Michael brought this up before, young people know in their hearts this doesn't work, whether it's with young men or young women. It doesn't take a lot for us to get the kind of work that that Ted talked about of getting young people to say, this doesn't work for us. This version of manhood and womanhood that you've drawn around us needs to be shattered and we know the ways as young people. So our work is, we have a curriculum called Manhood 2.0, Program H, it's been used in about 20 different countries. And young people write all the great activities. There's the gender equitable pickup line activity. Um, that's a fun one. <laughs> Don't think you can sit in there and take notes and you're going to get everything you want. But it is a really, that, that's a fun one that they come up with. Another one is young men in Chicago who we worked with got stories of young women's experiences of harassment, of sexual harassment on dates and other, and other spaces. And young men read these and think about them and practice the empathy that they already feel, but talk about it out loud. So very much about engaging young people as part of questioning this and then they design community-based campaigns. We've had them hired by condom manufacturers of how to sell condoms with gender equitable messages. So really it's, it's very much about tapping into what young people already can and want to do to change these norms, young men and young women working together. Another big piece that we do is around research. Um, we believe in making facts great again. Some of you may have seen them being bashed in recent years. <laughs> But one of the reasons we do this is because we didn't have a lot of research, Michael's and some others accepted, on where men are on these things. We kind of always assumed where men are. And a lot of our research just finds how much there is dissonance. There is dissent. <laughs> there is resistance. And in fact, no matter where we look, there's always a quarter to a third, even some very difficult places like Texas, like Afghanistan, I will put those in similar categories, where there's at least a quarter to a third of men who are in favor of something close to gender equality, who have experienced a lot of these things growing up, and whose voices can be brought along in the process. What we've also found in that research, probably the two biggest drivers of which men come out and have more equitable views about what it means to be men, two things show up again and again. An empowered mother, and in the context of a heterosexual relationship, a man who did some kind of the hands-on caregiving at home. Women adults who have told us, and this is a survey we've carried out with about 60,000 people in 30 countries, women who hold more equitable attitudes often have fathers who did some of the hands-on caregiving or at least didn't act like despots when they were doing decision making at the household level. That women can often, that's often one of the drivers and men who say their father did some amount of this. Um, so that drawing on the, the the power of what hands-on caregiving can do is one of the things that we tap into as well. We started in 2011 a global campaign called Men Care, kind of affirming what we think needs to be said a lot, <laughs> that we know how to do this, that men should be hands-on caregivers. And then in fact, that, that this idea that the care of children is, is women's work and men should be out being the breadwinners is probably the originator of our gender binary and probably where we need to take the fight. <laughs> so what we have, um, as a very simple goal, see if we can achieve this in a little while, is getting men to do 50% of the hands-on caregiving in our homes. Now, usually I say that and folks will laugh, but come on, yes, yes. <laughs> At a number of UN meetings that's been laughed about, like what has he been smoking and why does he think we could get men to actually do half of this? Um, but in fact, we think that's possible and we think that's one of the huge drivers of it. We're empowered by the fact that now there's actually some biological data that tells us what lots of us knew anyway. We've often said there's a maternal instinct, which really there isn't, we know. And there's not really a paternal instinct, but all of us as humans, actually, we now have some interesting research showing men who hold babies and are in close contact with children, our bodies biologically change as well. <laughs> we actually see a slight hormonal change, similar to what happens with women when they're breastfeeding or caring for a young child. We knew this and felt this, but it's great to have a piece of biological data that says men are wired for care. <laughs> our challenge is not that we're, it's pretty obvious, and it's not that in our work we're giving men back the ability to be connected, caring, empathy-seeking individuals, but to acknowledge that we always were, <laughs> and we're helping us recover them. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're about in the work, advocacy, research to drive it along, and empowering young people's voices, which I agree with you, Michael, yes, we can do something else for a living evidently pretty soon. <laughs> uh, Michael and I have children who are about the same age who, 
you know, when we are in doubt, we'll go to them and say, tell me what I need to know about gender. So thank you. <laughs> I know that we are at our time boundary, right? But I wonder if um, I could have just a little, like a five minutes. I wanted to give everyone, after listening to each other, the opportunity to, if they wanted to add anything or make a comment or anything, if that would be possible. Is that OK? It's just, yeah, very succinct. Some of my best friends are white men. <laughs> All right. Excellent addition. Excellent addition. If you're interested in exploring the idea of interconnectedness, let me know and join one of my heart trusts. Can I, in all seriousness, say an actual thing? Can I see a show of, a show of hands? Yeah. If any of you here have had an argument with someone who describes themselves as a feminist over whether or not sex work is sex trafficking or just labor? Oh, my God, oh yes, of course. No, I'm not opening the door. I am saying <laughs> we have a problem. Right? Because we have people on the same side. Yep. We're pitting them against each other. Whenever you have that kind of conflict, you need to find a better way to navigate it. So if you're in this argument with someone, stop shouting at each other. That's right. Right? Sit down and figure out a better way. Because the one immovable object that is presumed to be unchangeable in this equation is the entitlement to sex that men have. And you know, actually, if we just address that piece of it, we won't be fighting with each other uh, about the rest of it. So don't let anybody get into fights around you. Model okay. conflict resolution. Ted, do you want to add anything? Uh, just that um, I hope we can have continued conversations about things like this. You know, all of us having more conversations. It's really important out here doing this work so much, so much, but we don't often get together to, among each other, to have these conversations. So I think it's really important. There's a lot of great work being done, and we need to continue to do it. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged, but I noticed uh, Abigail and I didn't stand up with the, uh, the clapping about the end of patriarchy. Because <laughs> while I'm optimistic, <laughs> and I do feel there's a shift in the air, particularly with the younger generation, there's a huge amount of work to be done. And I get really worried as well about whether this work, and sometimes, you know, Ted, you may feel this as well, that it can feel like the flavor of the month work, that somehow it's just been discovered. This is not a one-off session. It's not a one-off conversation. It's not one great talk show on the radio. It's not one great TED talk. There's a huge amount of work still to be done. And I think we do need to celebrate how far we've come. And we, doing this work as male allies, are doing it because of what the feminist movement did for years to get it here. And that, is, that needs to be you know, said again and again. This was our inspiration. We're not doing it instead of, but I, I don't want any folks, while we feel good about it, there's a huge amount still to be done. It weighs heavily all over in so many spaces. So I, yeah, I want to cheer, <laughs> but there's a huge amount still to be, um, still to be done. OK, so I want to make a final comment. And um, it happened during the, the, my listening to, to our incredible panelists and speakers. And that is that um, at the same moment that um, there is a way more conversation, and I'm going to say mechanisms of support and opportunity for um, gender-based violence to come out into the culture and for these kinds of discussions to to take place. It's also a moment where we are um, having opportunities to dismantle the criminal justice system. And it's um, incredible entrenchment in white supremacy and um, you know, different forms of gender oppression. And that's not missed by any of us, but I wanted to put that out there because I think that one of the things that does not let things just be the flavor of the month, as we all have a concern, is connecting. And the interconnectedness that Malik is talking about needs to go that deep to all of us. Um, my thought went, um, you heard from Cynthia that we have had the opportunity to um, match in her stepping forward, Tarana Burke, in her leadership. 
That's all the New York Foundation is doing. Is in, and I said, better late than ever, right? It's taken 12 years for philanthropy, except there were a couple of initial investments in her leadership. The concern is to make what is a moment into an empowered, supported, um, we don't believe really that we empower anybody. We believe that we support people to, to be who they are, to fulfill their, their own beingness, their journeys. But it is also the time that we are doing a fund to close Rikers Island, to close our local mass incarceration, and specifically um, funding the closing of Rose M. Singer. So the reason why I mention this is because it's the currency of violence, it's the currency of, you know, it's a consequence of patriarchy, and is a consequence of white supremacy. And I think that it's important for us in the funding, the women's funding movement, in our understanding of feminism, and in our uh, practice. I mean, so much of the conversation is about what does restorative justice look like in such times of enormous inequality, right? What are the elements? Because you're talking about restorative justice, in my mind, on individual levels, on community levels, and societal levels. So I think that we live at a time where we have incredible opportunity to step boldly into answering these questions, as Malik said, into creating now what we want to see, quote unquote, then. So I want to thank Cynthia and the Women's Funding Network for putting this incredible uh, time together for all of us. And I want to thank you for choosing to be here, because there are many other things you could be doing with your time. And I want to especially thank our incredible um, leaders, colleagues, and fellow humans here who um, have given us enormous gifts in this very brief period of time. Thank you so much. Yeah.